Far from being swept off her feet, Elizabeth treated this royal attention with great care. She had rejected two proposals from Albert in the spring and autumn of 1921. Royal life offered little to a wealthy aristocrat's daughter. Prince Albert, however, was desperately in love and did not give up. He was in love once and forever, placing her at the center of his universe. Those around the Duke of York thought it a lost cause. Albert's elder brother wrote, Little Elizabeth Lyon, Duchess of York, I don't think. Decisively, Queen Mary, captivated by Elizabeth, became certain that this was the girl to make her distempered son happy. Through Albert's refusal to give up and gentle, relentless pressure by those around her, Elizabeth's resistance was slowly broken. A rumor that Elizabeth was to marry his eldest brother forced Albert to propose again. This time, she accepted. Elizabeth later told a friend, it was my duty to marry Bertie, and I fell in love with him afterwards. Elizabeth was honorable. She knew she could help Albert, and despite their different personalities, they shared so much. They were both deeply religious, had a strong sense of duty, and over time, affectionate love for each other. Elizabeth's only mistake was to provide an informal newspaper interview about her engagement, referring to her husband as Bertie. She received a stern telling off by the king, and she was never to speak out again. King George V ruled the wedding should be as quiet and as modest as a marriage in Westminster Abbey could be. The old king said, after all, it's not as if Bertie is heir to the throne. It was second place once again for Albert. The Duke and Duchess of York's marriage was a happy one. Witnesses claim they were deeply engrossed in each other at social occasions, sharing personal jokes. Elizabeth lightened the whole royal family. George V was described as always in good temper whenever Elizabeth was around. George V, a martinet for timekeeping, forgave Elizabeth's lateness, remarking, you are not late, my dear. We must have sat down two minutes early. Elizabeth and Albert brought their first child, Princess Elizabeth, into the world on the 21st of April, 1926. The birth of Elizabeth Alexandra Mary was difficult, needing a cesarean section. It had been a long time since there'd been a baby in the royal family, and the birth threw the Duke and Duchess into the media spotlight for the first time. Their second child, Margaret Rose, was born at Glans on the 21st of August, 1930. Yet more difficulties meant that the Duchess could not risk a further pregnancy. There would be no more babies. The Duke and Duchess doted on their children. The Duke was close to the young Elizabeth emotionally and in character. They understood each other deeply she inherited his shyness. Margaret was the delight in her father's life, a playful, affectionate bundle that both embarrassed and pleased him. The Duke and Duchess of York broke the pattern of coldness shaping the royal family's relationships, giving their children warmth and affection. That is not to say they were a normal family, the Duke and Duchess would disappear for months at a time, visiting far-flung parts of the empire. But the two princesses were brought up knowing that their parents loved them. The little family that the Duke and Duchess of York created, what Albert called Us Four, was a closed little world, where the inhabitants pretended that they were ordinary. Newsreel images of the time show the Duke and Duchess with the young Elizabeth and Margaret on outings like any family. They were never ordinary. 
an army of staff surrounded the children. They were taught privately by a governess and cared for by nannies, rarely meeting other children. Albert became known in the 1920s and 1930s as the Industrial Prince, busying himself with worthy trade exhibitions and factory visits. He also founded the Duke of York's camps, summer camps, bringing boys of all backgrounds together in healthy outdoor activities. Albert, the sportsman, enjoyed the fun and games, whilst Albert, the shy man, relaxed in simple company. The camps featured community singing, in which he would enthusiastically take part. This small family could have become a sideline of history, with Elizabeth and Margaret obscure members of the royal family, old ladies whose identity television has to explain on rare public appearances. But Prince Edward, Uncle David, would turn it all upside down. On the 20th of January 1936, King George V died helped on his way by a lethal injection from his doctor, Lord Dawson. On his deathbed, the old king said of his eldest son, After I am gone, the boy will ruin himself in 12 months. George V's bullying made Edward a man of low self-esteem. The new king was of a generation of men scarred by World War I. Edward had been forbidden to serve in the front line, forced to watch friends.